Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another uh, webinar in our TerraSource Global Series. Today's webinar topic is hammer mills. My name's Jack Logue, and I'm happy to be your presenter today. Today's agenda will cover one-way machines and reversible hammer mills. If you were around or present for my last webinar on impactors, I touched briefly at that time on the difference in the TSG world between impactors and hammer mills. Basically, both can be considered hammer mills, but I just wanted to review briefly again for you what differentiates a hammer mill from an impactor. We consider an impact or an open bottom machine that crushes strictly in impact and relies on the friability of the material and the speed of the crusher to do the reduction. A hammer mill in our product line is a machine that has internal sizing mechanism to control the output sizing. This may be a screen plate, a screen bar, a grade section, but internal of the machine, there is a sizing mechanism that all material needs to pass through before it exits the crusher. Where are hammer mills applied? Typically, we use them to crush medium to low abrasive materials where excellent control of the product top size is required. Typical output sizes with a hammer mill might range anywhere from at the, at the small end, a quarter of an inch, up to about a, an inch top size at the larger size. Today, as I mentioned, I'm going to be talking about one-way machines and reversibles. In a one-way hammer mill, material enters the machine to one side of the rotor assembly onto a breaker plate where impact occurs, and then the material was swept down into the crusher into the sizing section. As I mentioned, everything must pass through the screens to exit the crusher. There is a tramp iron pocket or collection area in the rear of the machine for uncrushable material. Typical hammer tip speeds vary anywhere from about 6,000 feet a minute to 12,000 feet a minute. Since the machine runs in only one direction, the hammers are going to wear only on one side, and they'll need to be turned by hand when they're worn in order to present another sharp face. On our reversible hammer mills, the direction of rotor rotation is reversed periodically. Generally, we would like to see it and never can be reversed too often, but generally every shift or every day, the customer will reverse the direction of rotation. Typically, the output sizes produced by a reversible hammer mill tend to be slightly smaller than the one-way machines. The material in this, in this style crusher falls directly on top of the hammers, directly on the rotor. There's an impact section at the top where the hammers drive the material against breaker plates, breaker blocks, and then the material swept down lower into the sizing section where there's screen bars and all the material passes through the bars or plate. The tramp iron pocket in a machine like this is located in the bottom of the crusher. And again, this seals the machine up so that the only way for material to exit the crusher is through the screen openings. Regular reversal of the rotor, changing the direction periodically, regularly, helps keep the hammers wearing on both sides of the face. You actually have two faces, and it spreads the wear over two cages, so you really have almost two crushers in one. Regular reversal keeps the hammer face sharp so that you don't need to go in and turn the hammers by hand. Now, what I'm going to talk about is we'll talk about one-way crushers 
and uh, their construction and how they're put together, features, and then I'll talk about the reversibles. Because of the combination of both the Penn brand and the Jeffrey Raider brand, we have several styles of one-way non-reversible hammer mills. These include the old DFC, the fixed cage machines that we use as primary crushers, our T hammer mills, which are secondary machines with adjustable cages, and then we have from the Jeffrey Raider line, the flex tooth machines and the AB hammer mill line. Then there's a small group of what I like to call light duty uh, JRT machines. And finally, the mini mill or sample crushers, as many of you are familiar with. If we look at the T hammer mill first, a lot of what I talk about applies to all the machines, but uh, I'll go through some slides on each one. The Type T machine typically has an input size of minus six inch. Uh, the feed opening is larger than that, but the hammers generally uh, are light enough that we don't really want to feed anything bigger than about six inch into this machine. Materials that are crushed in a machine like this can include limestone, various chemicals. A lot of these machines are on lime. We've sold several for crushing up sand molds where they're trying to recycle the molds. And generally the output sizes range down to about a quarter inch minimum, although most times you're talking about a half an inch to three quarters of an inch in size. Anything bigger than about three quarters or one inch as an output size, we'd probably look at using another type of machine such as an impactor or a roll crusher uh, because of the larger output size, there wouldn't be the need to pay the price of the horsepower and the wear that a, a hammer mill causes. Capacities for the T-mills generally range up to about 150 tons per hour. To control the product out output size, the T hammer mill uses either screen bars or screen plate. On the right of this picture here, I have what a typical screen plate might look like. Bars would just be individual bars uh, separated, and, and I'll show you some pictures as we, we get later into the presentation. The cage is adjustable to compensate for wear and to make slight changes in output size, but basically it's to compensate for wear on the hammers. The hammers, as I mentioned, because this machine runs in only one direction, must be turned by hand to present the new face. Typically, these hammers are manganese steel, but we also have several other alloys that we can use with that if the application calls for something that does, will not work hard, maybe you're crushing a material that's soft and you don't get work hardening, uh, we could use like some many of the cast alloys that we have available. The hammer weights range in size from about 70 pounds up to 60 pounds in size. These pictures uh, here show you where the access is in a machine like this. There are big doors uh, on the left-hand picture. That's what's considered the front of the crusher where the hopper is. So the door is taken off there. You can see the solid breaker plate, and then you can see the screens. The picture at the bottom shows the, the uh, ratchet wrench used for the adjustment mechanism and the large door in what's called the back where you would clean out the tramp iron trap. The other type of reversible, or excuse me, of one-way machine is the flex tooth crusher. Here what I've shown in a couple of pictures is the uh, standard FT flex tooth machine, and then on the right is what we call the easy open FTE model, where the frame is split to allow easy access to the interior. 
Also, from the Jeffrey brand, we can offer the AB and the ABE hammer mill line. The AB is, again, the standard frame. The ABE is the easy open frame style. The difference between the flex tooth machine and the AB hammer mills is basically in the hammer design, which we'll discuss further, and I have some pictures uh, later on. This is, a, this is a picture of a small ABE model with the easy open frame. Might be a 30 AB here, or a small mini mill would look like this also. Frame is sexualized, sectionalized to allow easy access. And here you can see we're using more of a blade type, uh, kind of a classic hammer, not the flex tooth hammer. Basically, the AB and the flex tooth machines, as I mentioned, are similar except for the hammers. Both feature 180 degree cages. If you notice, this cage is a longer cage than what I showed in the T hammer mill, where basically it's about a 120 degree cage. This cage is uh, 180 degrees for full coverage, and the machines use both either swing type hammers or we can use rigid hammers if the application calls for a hammer that won't lay back. Both machines feature the extended frame at the bottom and the idea with this is it gives a bigger discharge opening above the discharge chutes to reduce possible plugging in the chutes and in the bottom of the crusher. One of the more popular models of the Jeffrey brand are the mini mills, what's called the MME crushers. And here you have a couple of pictures of the mini mills. This crusher is the standard in coal sampling systems. You'll see them everywhere. Uh, to, and in a coal sampling system, what we're doing is we're using the mini mill to produce the ASTM specification size that they use to run their tests on the as-received coals at power plants and preparation plants. As I mentioned, the mini mill can be used on a variety of materials, not just coal. And what we find is we apply them many times when the application is small, the tons per hour are small, you know, one, two, three tons an hour, small applications where the other machines are too large. Again, it features all the things of the AB, the larger AB, different alloy steel hammers we can use, 180 degree cage, little tramp iron pocket and the easy access. Now, if we look at the reversible hammer mills, again, there are several models uh, to look at here. We have the Type C, that's a machine that we use in the stone market. Then we have the Type SXCA CB, which is a machine that's used to prepare coal in the for cyclone boilers and you had, was used in the past in the steel mills to, pre to uh, prepare coking coals. And then we have the FBR model which is a machine that we specifically designed for the fluid bed boiler market. And, and I'll go into each and kind of show you the differences in the, with pictures and that for each model. Basically, the C hammer mill and the SXC are very similar uh, other than in the rotor assembly, the size and the number of hammers, and in the cage in the type of screen bars that are used and the number and the layout of the screen bars. So the, the principles are the same, both reversible machines, uh, but how we set them up are different because the materials that we need to use and the size hammer we need to use is different for a stone application than for a fine grinding coal application. As I mentioned, the industries 
where we use these machines include the power plants where there's cyclone boilers, the steel mills where coking coal is being crushed before they charge the coke batteries. However, most of these applications uh, have been replaced over time by our coal packers. If you remember, we discussed coal packers last time. Uh, it's the reversible impactor that's specifically designed for crushing coals to a size that can be charged in a coke oven. Most of the old hammer mills that are located at steel mills have been replaced by coal packers, or we've actually converted the insides to a coal packer internal. Capacities for these machines run up to 800 tons per hour. Uh, the areas where you'll see us use the stone machines are in lime plants, aggregate plants, and at cement plants. Reversible hammer mills feature adjustable cages because, as I mentioned earlier, generally these machines are used for relatively small products as far as hammer mills go. So we want to be able to have the adjustment possibility to compensate for wear. The larger machines have what we call a synchronous cage adjustment. Larger, I talk about wider, too, and the cages are quite wide. So what we try to do is we, we have gear jacks connected by a synchronizing rod, and we can adjust both jacks from a single point so that the cage stays parallel to the rotor assembly. The smaller machines have single point adjustments where the, the uh, wrench is on the outside of one side of the machine. Uh, and the, we actually have in some of our more basic machines, we would have straight screw jacks, which is just basically a big bolt that an Acme threaded bolt that would push on the cage and adjust the cage that way. As I often do, I, I, I break the machines down into the four basic sub-assemblies. If you look at it that way, they, they tend to be more manageable. All the crushers have a frame, a rotor assembly, cage assemblies, and a tramp iron pocket. And we'll look, at, we'll look at the rotor and the cages in detail because that's really where the heart of the crushers are. Uh, as I mentioned, in the reversible machines, your tramp iron pocket's in the bottom, and in your one-way machines, it's in the back of the machine. I'm going to show you several different rotor assemblies because the rotor assemblies vary from model to model, and basically, depending on what type of hammer we're using in the machine, the overall design is slightly different from machine to machine. Basically, the rotor assemblies consist of a rotor shaft with dis discs that are slid onto the rotor, keyed to the rotor, and held with lock plates. But, and the hammers hang between the discs from suspension bars. Our units use both staggered arrangements and tracking arrangements depending on the application. We use staggered arrangements when we're trying to produce a small output size and we have to cover all the space between the hammers. We don't want any oversize in a tracking hammer arrangement where all the hammers follow one another you have the spaces between the hammers that oversize can pass through. So we can shift all the hammers, and uh, that's what's called a staggered arrangement, so the hammers cover the space between the preceding row's hammers. This is a picture of a typical rotor shaft. These shafts are forged steel, and all of our rotor shafts are drilled for hydraulic bearing removal. That is, there's, uh, they are drilled axially and then radially under the bearing seat so that you can pump oil into the shaft and up underneath the bearing to free the bearing off the bearing taper if you need to replace the bearing without the need for a bearing puller. Our discs are drilled for multiple hammer arrangements. This is done for a couple of reasons. Uh, it gives some flexibility in output sizing if you can change 
the number of rows of hammers that you have installed in the machine, but also a lot of the, we will have a spare set of holes in the discs so that when you change hammers, you can index the hammers, the suspension bars to the next set of holes and you spread the wear over the entire disc. So each time the hammers are changed, you can use the alternate set of holes to when you install the new hammers. The hammers also vary in size depending on the size crusher. This is a typical PCC hammer mill hammer shown here. This is a forged steel hammer, differentially heat treated so that the head is hard but the shank is more ductile. So as you go gradually out the shank towards the head, the hammer gets harder and the working face of the hammer tends to be about 450 to 500 Brunel hardness where the shank itself may only be 300 Brunel. So what you're trying to do is get a hard working face and a ductile shank that's forgiving of uncrushable material. The picture you see at the bottom there is one of our forged steel hammers with the hard facing, the tungsten carbide hard facing applied to the working face. We can apply this hard facing in several different arrangements, and we'll talk more about this. I'll have a couple other pictures later on. Now here are some pictures of the flex tooth hammer that's used in the Jeffrey brand machines. The flex tooth hammer comes with a, reversible, with a replaceable head, as you see in the left, uh, the right hand top picture there, you can actually have a, a replaceable section on the hammer, or they come as a one piece casting in a variety of different alloys. Again, whatever we need, we have abrasive ap a a an abrasive application, we'll go to a more abrasive resistant. If you have a good old stone application, you can put a manganese hammer in there. On the left, you see some typical arrangements of the flex tooth hammer. I want to talk a little bit more about the flex tooth. With the Pennsylvania, the, the free swinging T head hammer that you saw when I showed the forged teal hammer, the flex tooth hammer is a little bit different though design. It employs a cantilevered Mominar design, which allows it to operate at relatively slow speeds for a swinging hammer and yet still allows the hammer to lay back if it encounters an uncrushable. What this does is it allows us to operate the crushers at slower speeds than you might be with other hammer designs and produce less fines than what a conventional hammer mill might produce. What this allows us to do is it allows us to take advantage of the large reduction ratio that a hammer mill offers, but at the same time, kind of lean toward producing less fines than a conventional hammer mill at the speeds that that would run. So what this does, it allows us to use to take advantage of the high reduction ratio instead of having to go with a roll crusher in all instances, because the roll crusher is really the ideal way you'd want to go. However, it's limited in its reduction ratio. So when we have big feeds or we have a large reduction ratio required, we tend to look at the flex tooth as an alternate to our rolls. Here's a typical flex tooth. Uh, rotor assembly. Again, notice the hammers are staggered here. If we look at the if we look at the sizing section of the crushers now, I'm going to show you several different arrangements that we can use there because here again, each of the different designs uses uh, a different approach because of what we're trying to do, the output size we're trying to attain. The cages in a reversible crusher are generally made up of an impact section. That's where the breaker plate is located. And in this picture, that would be at the right-hand side of this cage, right below the hinge shaft. 
You have a breaker plate section, and then you have a scrubber section where the screen bars are very small openings bars, not necessarily intended to pass material through them. What happens is they form more of a washboard scrubbing section, and then you go down into the screen bar area and into the sizing section. The screen bars are installed in a, in a reusable cage frame. This cage frame lasts for many years, and all it, when the screen bars are worn, you, you take them out of this cage and you reload new parts into it. The screen bars that we use are a special shape. Shown here on the left, is the screen bar. Shown on the right is the scrubber bar. The scrubber bar is a rectangular bar. Keep in mind that we said really what it's there for is to just to form this scrubbing area to generate the fine material. Basically the special shape, the idea with that is it maintains a, a parallel surface for one inch down the bar and then flares open. The idea with the flaring open is that it is a self-cleaning or a, a more forgiving screen bar arrangement for wet material. Here's a, a picture that might describe that better here. What ha on the left, on the right hand picture, what, what this does is it angles the bar to be more favorably aligned to the material sweeping down over the screen bars. This allows the material to more easily exit the crusher. On the left-hand picture, if you ha this shows all rectangular bars. And you can see that the material needs to turn 90 degrees in this arrangement to exit. We've run tests with both setups and definitely the uh, special section bar and the, the uh, cage shown on the right produces much higher capacities than the, the arrangement on the left. All the bars on, on, sit on replaceable seats as part of the cage so that uh, the, think of the screen bar seat as a liner, a replaceable liner. So I mentioned that when the bars are worn, they're taken out and the cage is reused. Well, this, this liner protects the cage so that it lasts longer. In the flex tooth and the AB models, the same idea, this angled bar arrangement that I described with the screen bars, applies to what we call our slant flow grate sections. Again, rather than individual bars here, we're using grate sections, but again, the angle of the grates is, is, is angled so that the material has a, a less torturous path to get out of the crusher, and it uh, promotes flow through the machine and out of the hammer mill, slant flow grates. Another picture where, as I mentioned, it's inclined to align with how the material is being swept through the hammer mill. It increases capacity and reduces the plugage. Okay, we'll talk about the SXC hammer mills. This is more of a, a special machine, but I, I, there are a few slides that I wanted to show you on this machine. Uh, this is a machine that we use to crush Powder River Basin coal, and also, in some cases, uh, to crush difficult coals at high capacity for fluid bed boilers. Uh, what we developed from this machine is what we call our fine grind cage. This cage has a longer crushing path, it has more scrubber bars, and the screen bar openings are smaller than in a conventional reversible hammer mill. Here's a picture of 
a fine grind cage. Again, it has the impact section at the top, then you can see the scrubbing section, and then the screen bars down in the lower section. The price we pay for this tighter gap between the screen bars is, is a higher horsepower. You get the smaller output sizing, but at the expense of much higher horsepower. A machine equipped with a cage like this might draw twice to three times the horsepower of a conventional hammer mill, but the output size would be in the range of three to four mesh output sizing, top size. If we compare the standard cage to the fine grind cage, uh, a couple of the items that drive this higher horsepower demand is that we raise the pinch point, the pinch point being the tightest point between the hammer circle and the cage. We raise that higher in the crusher zone so that we have more time between hammer uh, change outs. In other words, as the hammers wear, we, we can go lower and lower in the cage before we lose our product sizing. As I mentioned, we, we increased the number of scrubber bars and we added a, a Z block up in the top to assist in the fine grind crushing. I, I mentioned earlier about hard facing and we have several different styles of hard facing. Here, what I show here is uh, two beads on the working face and no hard facing on the top of the hammer. Generally, our hard facing is applied in one inch wide beads, about an eighth of an inch thick, but we can do lots of different things with the hard facing. We can put hard facing on the top of the head. We can put one, two beads on the face. We can put two beads on the head, top of the head. Lots of different arrangements depending on where the hammer sees the most wear. Not every hammer wears in the same spot. Keep in mind that the way the material enters into a crusher varies from installation to installation. The angle at which it enters the machine is not always the same. The height of drop, the speed at which it enters is not always the same. So we see different wear patterns on different hammers and we can adjust the hard surface setup to accommodate that. The idea again, with the, ha with the hard face on the area that you see it here is to keep the face sharp because it's that edge, that sharp face that produces the output size. Again, we can do the same thing with the screen bars. In this picture, on top of the screen bar, there is that one inch wide, eight inch thick hard facing. Keep in mind, the hammers are sweeping down over the top of this bar, and if we could keep this bar from wearing, we get longer life from the screen bar. Okay, kind of the last hammer mill I want to talk about is a machine that we developed for the fluid bed boiler market back in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, our experience as a group, that is all the TSG brands, has been that we supplied the crusher for the first fluid beds and we've supplied more crushers for fluid bed boilers than any other manufacturer. All of the different brands have been involved in this market uh, and I wanted to talk about the hammer mills that we have applied to this, to this market. Keep in mind that fluid bed boilers can burn a variety of fuels. That's one of the advantages they have. And we've sold crushers for crushing bituminous coal, subbituminous coal, lignites, petroleum coke. Uh, if you were, uh, last time I talked about in our impactor presentation, where we've sold many, many coal packers for crushing petroleum coke for fluid bed boilers. But Fluid bed boilers can also burn the waste coals, the piles of material left behind from the old coal mining days. In the anthracite fields, these are called combs, and in the bituminous fields, these are called gobs. But basically what they are is are coal wastes with high ash contents and a lot of clay and junk in the pile besides the coal. Also, we have sold crushers 
to crush limestone, which is used as a sorbent in the fluid bed boiler, typically as a primary, not as the final sizing with the limestone. Keep in mind that all of our crushers that are crushing the fuel for the fluid bed boilers are the only crushers in the line. There aren't pulverizers to rely upon, so the output size that comes from the crusher before a fluid bed boiler is what's fed directly into the boiler. The FBR hammer mill is the machine that we developed and sold uh, with the first fluid bed boilers. It was designed to make output sizes in the 6 to 10 millimeter, which is quarter inch to half inch size, which is a relatively small size, if you remember, for the hammer mills. We, we built them in three different series, three different hammer circle diameters, if you will, depending on what tonnage, and up to about 325 tons per hour. We did a, a couple of things different with the FBR machines than, than you saw with some of the old, newer or some of the other hammer mills that I showed. One of the interesting things that we did is that I, I previously showed you the rotor discs where we drilled the discs for different hammer arrangements. But basically, those holes were all on the same radius from the rotor shaft itself. What we played around with with the FBR hammer mills is we actually drilled sets of holes on two different radiuses so that by putting the hammers in a different set of holes, you actually changed the hammer tip speed because the hammer was not that far, standing that far out, and the rotor diameter, the, the, the hammer circle diameter, was changed. So if you put the hammers in the outer setter holes, you had one hammer tip speed, but if you were producing too many fines, you could drop it back into the other set of holes, and you could change the speed, not a lot, but in the 10 to 15 percent range, and sometimes that was enough to reduce the generation of fines, or sometimes we had to go the other way, and we needed a little more impact, and we'd use the outer setter holes. This was kind of a, an interesting way to change the hammer tip speed without having to change the motor speed of the crusher. This is a typical cage section uh, in the FBR hammer mills. And here, rather than those individual bars that I showed in the previous slides, what we're using here is bolt-in screen plate. Uh, there was reasons for that. In this picture on the left, you can see the upper section, you have the impact section, the solid breaker plate. But in the bottom, we have bolt-in plates. Generally, these plates would not last as long as the bars, and they weren't as deep and as thick. But with these fuels that I described, what we had to do was go to thinner plate that was more forgiving of wet, sticky material. Yes, you, you, you had to do some things and use some AR materials and and that to lengthen the life. But these were in applications where we could not necessarily put a four inch deep bar or a big deep grade section in because they would plug. The material did not want to flow. So we would use a slotted screen plate that might be inch thick, inch and a quarter thick, and they would be replaceable in that manner. We also built in some accessibility for these tougher fuels as you can see here, the entire door opened, and when the door opened, the cage came with the door to allow easy access to the rotor assembly and to the screens. Uh, optional uh, hydraulic door openers were available in the bigger machines, the wider machines, where it was more difficult to rig and open the doors. And that's all I have for today. Uh, welcome to uh, entertain any your, any questions that you have. I'll be happy to try to answer them. Thanks a lot for uh, participating today. Jack, appreciate it. Man. Thanks, Jack. You're welcome. My pleasure. If we don't have any questions, uh, I'll let you all go. But I thank you again for taking part this afternoon, and uh, I'll talk to you again soon.